You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Juliet Spear. Political rhetoric surrounding military intervention in Syria is dominating the domestic and international news agenda. But what about the effect the war is having on women? According to the UN's refugee agency, more than two million Syrians are now registered as refugees. Families torn apart are seeking refuge every day. Joining me to discuss the effect civil war has on women and the untold stories that rarely surface, I'm joined by Bidisha, who is a writer, broadcaster and outreach worker who specialises in social justice, human rights and international affairs. Henry Mietinen, a senior researcher on gender issues for the peace-building organization International Alert. And on the telephone, Dr. Hala Diab, who's a Syrian writer, filmmaker and women's rights activist. And Julie Bindle, co-founder of the group Justice for Women. Bidisha, you wrote an article saying that what's happening to the women and children of Syria is tragic but also classic. The stigmatization of victims and the impunity of abusers are endemic globally. Can you begin our discussion by talking about the effects civil war has on women? There are so many effects that, in a sense, to understand them all, you wind up thinking, oh my God, the worst I've ever heard about life is true. So you have um, mass rape. This is unfortunately, and I hate saying this, it's common, it's endemic, but you also have years of trauma Afterwards, you have displacement and you have an extreme stigmatization of victims. So you have traumatized victims who feel they cannot talk about what's happened to them because they themselves will be not just disbelieved, but rejected, ostracized. At the same time, you have a kind of international community where you have many human rights groups on the ground who know what's going on. But then you have governments who are very slow to act, who are slow to recognize. It's very difficult to write down and log all of these cases. So you have this great morass of sexual abuse, and that includes rape, includes sexual torture, it includes the detention of women and girls, but also, as in Syria, 20% at least of the victims are men. Detention for sexual uses, and what what the colloquial term for that, unfortunately, is rape camps, or it's about sexual torture in prisons, people being picked up, taken away, tortured, and so on and so forth. And then you have another outer ring. So you have sexual exploitation, you have trafficking, you have sexual coercion. And it's not a gray area at all. It's just abuse. But the trauma is so great, it's almost hard to approach it. And I think this is where the international community has trouble. Before we return to many of the aspects that you've mentioned there, Henry, how disproportionate are the effects of warfare on women? You can tell us a bit about your studies as well in this answer. Sure. Uh, so um, at International Alert, I'm um, leading on this research project at the moment, which is looking at gender and peace building. So not so much at the conflict time space itself, but what happens after the conflict. Um, and um, as Bericha was saying, there's a lot of sort of long-term effects of, of, of the conflict, of the violence, <coughs> of exploitation, um, but then also a lot of sort of um, secondary effects that affect women a lot. For example, women tend to be the primary caregivers for the family. Uh, men often are traumatized by uh, the impacts of conflict, by the impacts of being in a refugee camp in, in societies where men tend to be the primary breadwinners. It's a bit, often a very sort of, um, for lack of a better word, emasculating experience for them when they cannot fulfill their traditional masculine roles in the refugee camps. And that leads to um, a lot of sort of trauma amongst men as well, which then unfortunately also plays out as domestic violence in cases, as sexual violence. Um, so it's a very, very complex issue. And um, also, as Badisha was saying, it's, it's not really a gray area. It's something that often is happening under the eyes of the international community, I mean, literally in the camps, for example, which are run by um, NGOs, by international NGOs, by international agencies. <clears throat> um, and I think... Um, also, as Badisha was saying, is unfortunately, it is something that tends to be endemic to conflict. Um, and um, it's something that has been ignored for decades, for centuries, but is coming up on the table now. Julie Bindle, I'd like to just to introduce you to the discussion. Uh, you mentioned in an article that in any crisis, the women come last. What was your experience um, like when you visited a refugee camp? 
Well, I went to the Tari refugee camp, which is uh, in northern Jordan, just 15 miles away from the Syrian border, and it's home to, well, then it was home to 120,000 people escaping the, the violence uh, in Syria. Three quarters are women and children, um, and many of these women um, have, of course, experienced sexual torture and violence um, as a weapon of war in Syria. They then come to what is supposed to be a safe haven, a refugee camp. And of course, they're then, as Badish has already pointed out, and Henry, um, they're then very, very vulnerable to further sexual violence, not just by men in the camp who see an opportunity to be able to abuse a vulnerable and unaccompanied woman, but by those who see her as a commodity, for example, traffickers, those that sell women from the camp or within the camp, children who are sold at the border um, to, to rich men, uh, men who are looking for a child bride. Um, then, of course, there's rape when women go to the latrine at night. In fact, there are women who dare not go to the latrine after 7 o'clock at night in Zutari for fear of being raped. And, and a, a recently published report by the International Rescue Commis Committee found that domestic violence within Zutari is both endemic and not policed adequately because these things are left, um, as they often are, as something that is seen as so regular, so normalised, so commonplace, that why on earth should we intervene in what seems to be to them a private relationship. You know, we have both commercial exploitation by opportunists and we have the type of sexual violence that women routinely face in their lives, but in such close quarters, with such tension brewing, and so many women who, who are there without protection, of course, far worse. And, and what's really scandalous about this, and, and I interviewed many um, NGO members, many people who are policing the camp and, and also government uh, officials and policymakers, is that really this is seen as something that they just don't want to, to uncover. They don't really want to lift up the stone. Because if it's seen that prostitution and trafficking is happening, for example, within Zatari, how on earth are you supposed to police it uh, in general if such security breaches uh, are going unchecked? Thanks, Julie. Um, Dr. Heli Diab, how can these women's voices be heard? Um, I just want, before I ask you, uh, answer your question, I want to go back to the absent aspect that your guest really didn't touch on regarding, in particular, Syrian women cases. Uh, we are also dealing here with sectarian and religious division within the Syrian society, which affect actually about the sexual violence that is practiced on women. Because most of sexual assault that women facing in the refugee camp or even in displaced places in Egypt or Jordan or Lebanon is actually based on the fatwa, Islamic fatwa, which legitimize and legalize the jihad marriage where Syrian women now can marry a jihadist for a few days and then the jihadists will go back to Syria and fight. And this is all legal in, in the name of religion. And uh, I'm sure that your guest who was in the refugee camp is aware of this fact. And even those women, there is underage forced marriage of girls who are in their 15 and 14 in the refugees camp who are getting married to Saudi rich men or Arab men. All, uh, and this is all legitimized by in the name of religion. And we need to understand that the Syrian woman is different from uh, other Arab women because Syrian women, especially women who came from outside Damascus, Aleppo homes, some of them, they're not very educated. They come from very conservative cultural environment. Some of them, they were not part of the workplace. And uh, now they are found themselves displaced. They lost the father, they lost the husband, and they cannot deal with the trauma. They cannot deal with the fact they have to be responsible for their family. Some of them, they don't have education. Some of them, they don't have uh, ability to work. Hence, there is kind of uh, sexual violence or violation of these women, which is not practiced by only detention and prisoner, which is a classic image of uh, violation, but also by the rebels, by the uh, jihadists, by al-Qaeda in Syria, who arrest uh, women from uh, allow it uh, 
uh, towns and cities and really rape them. And they see this is legal because, uh, because they, they base that on religious grounds. We cannot speak about violation of women's rights in Syria without talking about religion uh, base or uh, sectarian basis. To voice uh, the, 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 the women, Arab women or Syrian women in this dilemma is to, to work with uh, NGOs, with civil rights societies, with organizations, with activists to empower these women in displaced areas and in refugees camp, to try to help them empower their skills to uh, even to work or even to involve them in uh, voluntary work or even through education to create out of these women who now uh, try to, to who have no money to, to survive they have to sell their daughters to have a bread to change them from victims into uh, uh, people who are capable to produce something uh, even if they do bake cakes or even they make dresses or to, to, in, to empower these women, not only through talking about what they suffer from, but to help them to change their situation. Dr. Dieb, you answered brilliantly then the actual question I started with, how do you help make these women's voices heard? And you put it very eloquently, but by empowering them and giving them a voice and not just helping them, but offering advice and support to help them progress with normal life. Bidisha, you looked like you wanted to uh, say something. I was feverishly writing notes there. I just wanted to say that I absolutely accept what Dr. Diab says, and I'm so grateful for that nuanced, deep history uh, perspective on it, because I think it's very easy to say, there's a war, what do you expect? All perpetrators behave like this, all victims behave in this way, this is just awful, it says something awful about human nature in in a kind of generalised sense, but of course, what we know about rape in peacetime as well as war is that perpetrators are opportunistic stick they are not on either or any side of the political line. Their excuses and justifications are entrenched in a sense of entitlement, which is backed up by politics, by religion. And this goes back thousands of years. And I absolutely also accept this point that what is needed is at the same time as we're having lots of discussions about military action, what kind of military action we're going to do in Syria, there needs to be a broad based humanitarian and political discussion about what we do to rehabilitate, to create order peace and a sense of safety and treatment of trauma in the refugee camps which are in all the countries bordering Syria so we're serving a population which is displaced and traumatized not just in the short term but in the long term exactly as Dr Diab says but I also wanted to just give props to Julie Bindle there because her article about uh, about Zatari camp in Standpoint magazine actually inspired my own because what's happening is obviously I'm a journalist and so I, you're kind of between politics and human rights. I was getting reports from the International Rescue Committee from Human Rights Watch. I was following what International Alert do which is why I'm so happy to meet Henry and I was looking at the newspapers and there was really relatively little about the sexual violence and I thought hang on it's not possible that these newspapers don't know what's going on they're getting the same reports I do so what is this big silence and it seems to me that this question of silence surrounding sexual violence and what perpetrators do is a universal thing I just want also to support your uh, your view by saying there is so much masculinizing of actually the crisis of Syria. It's always looked at from a very male perspective, like we need war, people want weapons, uh, it's military, uh, let's wage war against, let's airstrike Syria. But they don't look at the uh, female or woman perspective on this war, that women want stability, want security. They are, they are victims of this war, and they don't have, uh, uh, they have... Uh, the women, Syrian women, have not been highlighted in the political or even in the crisis of Syria, apart from being the victims, being the refugees, being the displaced mother, mother the raped, the, the, the objects on which these atrocities are exposed. However, uh, even, even if, you, if you look at the Syrian crisis or for two years, they try to masculinize uh, women's role in this, in this crisis by using them even as in military. Uh, uh, as in like Free Syrian Army, they use women in order to fight. So it's, it's always on the advantage of the patriarchal male, uh, especially Islamic-oriented ideology of women-men uh, division, where men go and fight, and then women has to sit at home 
uh, and and uh, uh, bear the responsibility and the responsibility and the uh, atrocities that is going on in Syria. And that's something that Henry mentioned earlier about the displacement of men into the refugee camps and the emasculation of men. What effect is that having on the role of men and women in this in these situations? I mean, first of all, I, I sort of agree with Dr. Diab on, <clears throat> on the masculinization of the crisis, and but sort of maybe put that in a bit a bit of a different way. Um, it's a certain kind of masculinization. It's a militarized masculinization that's happening there, um, which is focused on a certain type of a certain way of being a man, which is linked to the use of power, to um, standing up to the uh, well standing up to the international community or standing up to the enemy, whatever it may be. And there seems to be like in also in, this, in sort of the broader political picture, this sense that um, world leaders have to do something to prove their masculinity, to prove that they stand up for the word. So I think that's 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 correct in a sense, but it is a certain kind of masculinity that that's being played out. Um, and I think in the um, in the work that we've been doing in other contexts, similar kinds of contexts of displacement, long term displacement, uh, for example, in northern Uganda and in, in the Great Lakes region, um, you do see this very sort of strong long-term impact on communities, on men and women, be- being forced into camps and being forced to live off somebody else's donations, basically, uh, completely changes the way that uh, men see the, the role in society, how women see the role, role in society. A lot of times the, um, the kind of aid which is focused on uh, to, to refugees, to international displaced people is focused towards women uh, and that sort of on the one hand can strengthen their position in society but can also undermine it because then there's a black backlash from men who say that uh, they are not getting uh, the same amount of help they are not getting the respect that they are used to getting from society so it's, it's a very complex issue there so what you're saying is the the help uh, given to to women to rebuild their lives has a detrimental effect sometimes on their relationship with their husband or father because they are emasculated, not given the same help, and they feel redundant from their position in society. And this redundancy gives way to domestic violence. Uh, yes, yes. And I think that that's sort of... Um, it's important, I find, and that's sort of part of the work that we're, we're doing at the moment, is to try and see gender as a relational issue to work with men and women on these issues and not focus on either women or men. And I think something that Dr. Diab also said is also very important. It's about the sort of the the way that women are portrayed as victims without agency. And that's something that needs to be, I find needs to be changed. Um, They they have, have become, men and women have become victims of the situation, but they also do have agency, they do have power. And it's important to sort of support them and empower them in this situation rather than place them into a situation where they only have to wait out for handouts from the international community. Just to come to you again, Julie, why on earth is it that you're one of the few people to have actually reported on this in, in a refugee camp? Well, women always come last uh, in any crisis, as, as we said earlier. Uh, and because, of course, the machismo uh, of, of many reporters, many male reporters, means that they actually ignore what's happening to women and children because they're only women and children. And they're seen as somehow you know, the, the forgotten casualties of war. And then you also have issues such as domestic violence, which is endemic in the Tari camp, as it's endemic in many women's lives all over the world, that's ignored because it's seen as ordinary family relations. Then, of course, you have journalists, Western journalists, who take the very harmful, in my opinion, uh, cultural relativist view, which is that, Oh, well, early marriage, as they call it. I call it child rape. But early marriage is, of course, what they do. You know, we can't interfere in their culture. And, of course, there's nothing cultural or religious about violence against women and children. It happens everywhere. The culture is, in fact, patriarchy uh, rather than anything that's out there. Now, if you look um, at some of the attitudes of the NGOs, many of whom uh, are doing absolutely brilliant work to protect the Syrians from further harm, and giving them a home uh, and, and, and relative safety. Some of the people said to me at Zatari that they um, accepted that 13-year-olds get married to older, rich Saudi Arabian men who buy them because that 
was their age of consent, that that's what they did. Polygamy, which is very harmful to women, um, is also now far more routine among Syrian women than it was previously. Because, of course, as Badisha said, this is you know, an opportunist issue. Men who see that they have the right to do this, to take more than one wife in order for them to shore up their patriarchal power, will do so. And domestic violence on the camp, um, as Henry mentioned, which is a really serious issue. And let's not just look at the kind of um, you know, bigger issues of rape as a weapon of war. Let's look at the everyday instances of domestic violence. There are between 200 and 250 police officers on duty at any one time in the camp. And yet, you know, there have been no convictions whatsoever for domestic violence. One senior police officer said to me um, that the only case that he'd heard of of domestic violence was in fact when a, a girl uh, had her, her arm broken by the father. But this was resolved because the girl decided not to press charges. Well, that, for me, is not resolving the issue. That's like looking at the UK uh, 30 years ago when we saw it as a private matter. And it's not acceptable that we think it's all right when it happens to Syrian women and girls. It's not all right where it happens and to whom it happens. It's a crime, and it should be treated as that. And this opportunistic behaviour by the perpetrators and the effects that has is is a rise in the number of child rapes, a rise in human trafficking, the displacement of women who are sold as commodities around the world. So it is a global problem. That uh, Can someone, Badisha, answer me why no one lifts the lid, why it's not talked about? Something very perverse happens, which is that the abuse of women in general is so common that it's seen as unremarkable. Isn't that strange? So if one drop falls on the table, we notice it. But if it's showering on the table, we just go, ah, it's showering. Let's go somewhere else. Let's shut the door and forget about it. So on the one hand, there is a great morass of abuse. This is absolutely endemic globally. This is endemic globally. It is abuse, as Judy says, and I'm so glad that we are we're reclaiming that word and, say, and calling a spade a spade. But then there is a kind of mass denial. I don't think it's because all of the deniers, the politicians, the activists are somehow woman haters. I think it's the opposite. I think they believe, but they can't handle it. Because I don't think you can disbelieve this number of victims. You can't disbelieve reports which are coming from Human Rights Watch and the UN. It's that the trauma, the effect is so great. That sense of, oh my God, this is common. This is p perpetrators are not these weirdos, these beasts who wear masks, who've got beast tattooed on the head. They're normal people. They're functional. You know, they look like, well, they don't look like you or me, but they look like a colleague, a friend, a brother, a father. They look, this is absolutely normalized. I think that's what the world at large has a huge amount of difficulty accepting. And I want to say also this denial is because of uh, shame, especially when it comes to Syrian society, uh, because many women might be raped or many little children might be abused sexually by their relatives, by their fathers, by their uh, neighbors, but they can't talk about it because the family always blame the woman. Even in the Middle East, if the woman is raped, they will say, you have, have led them to rape you. So it's always the guilt, the shame, which make women in capable to express, to express this kind of violation. And also because of man-woman relationship in, 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 in the crisis in Syria. We've seen a lot of Arab men or Muslim men who go to Syria, even Syrian men, uh, they express their sel themselves through violence. Because in uh, Syrian culture, uh, as it is in Arab culture, uh, because of religious uh, suppression, because of sexual boundaries uh, in, in the Middle East, the only way for men to express themselves is through violence. And that's why we see uh, a lot of, uh, of this violence is expressed in the Syrian crisis. And also a part of it is the sexual violence, which is just a, a continuity of this motion of violence, especially among uneducated men or men who have um, uh, led by uh, some uh, revenge uh, towards what happened to their families. 
and and women are paying for for this for this uh, for this what's happening in Syria. And if you look even about like British or some uh, non-Arab women, Muslim women who came from Tunisia, from Belgium, from even England to Syria to offer themselves to the jihadis to be their wife. And uh, this is an abuse. This is violation. And yet they see it legal because this will lead them to paradise. This will lead them to Jannah. This will be, lead them to salvation. We need to uh, free women, liberate them from this notion of that women should be always playing the role of victims. They should offer to be uh, to be uh, uh, to to reach salvation. That women should be the victim mother. To should be to the victim's wife. Should offer uh, to other people. And we need to empower her as an independent woman that has a role within the society, um, whether it's in Syria or or in the Arab world. That returns to the point that Henry Meaton then made earlier about empowerment of, of women. Picking up what uh, Dr. Diop said there about uh, sort of the link between masculinities and violence, and I think that's sort of an, a very important, or can be a very important entry point, is to try and break that link to work with men, work with men, women and men, on finding different forms for men to express themselves. Men are not created in a factory that produces men and then they come out. Uh, they are created by society, by the men and women around them, by their mothers, by their sisters, by their girlfriends, by their wives, as much as by their fathers, by the institutions of the state, of school. So I think that's where important work can be done and should be done about finding different ways for men to be as men, which are not violent, which do respect women. And there's some uh, fantastic grassroots organizations also in the Middle East, in, in Lebanon, for example, who are starting to do this kind of work, working with men, working with women, on changing the way that men and women relate to each other and breaking that uh, link between violence and masculinity. And um, I think another point that Dr. Diab mentioned there, which is really important, is the, uh, the amount of shame that victims of sexual violence uh, feel and are made to feel by society, which makes it really difficult to work with that. And uh, that is also t- perhaps even more so the case for male victims, men and boys who also are victims of sexual violence, also in, in Syria, in the camps. And that is, it's, it's a huge silence around that issue. And that, that is something that um, the international community, I think, also needs to be much more vocal about. And uh, look ourselves in the mirror and say, see that that's not something that only happens in, in conflict situations, but also happens in our own societies on a daily basis. We need to uncover the endemic abuse that's happening to women in hard-to-reach communities. But we also need to recognize that sexual violence is a weapon of patriarchy, not just a weapon of war. The way that women and girls are treated um, by men is unfortunately a product of the fact that men are born and assigned more power than women. So we need to look at the root and branch cause of sexual violence. Finally, Bidisha, I absolutely second everything that's been said. This is really about patriarchal power. I don't talk about masculinity, I talk about machismo, because I think the machismo mindset, whether it's perpetrated by men or women, is what has destroyed the world, the planet, society, absolutely, absolutely everything. And it's about looking at the root cause, because I don't believe for one second that rape is inevitable. I don't think that men, if you gave them perfect liberty, would all turn into rapists at all. I think this is about deep, deep, deep inequality. And I think it's also about changing the fundamental fabric of society and giving women a place at the table, which you have so generously done. This is why this conversation is progressive and interesting. It's because we're part of the conversation. I just think that the world would change if we had an equal and fair place at the table to speak. I'd like to thank all my guests, Badisha there, writer, broadcaster and outreach worker, Henry Mutinen, Senior Researcher on Gender Issues at the Peacebuilding Organisation International Alert, Julie Bindle, co-founder of the group Justice for Women. And Dr. Hala Diab, Syrian writer, filmmaker and women's rights activist. Thank you very much.